Well, we are here today at the uh, Lime Rehack at Post 72 of the American Legion, and today it is December 4th, uh, 2005, Sunday morning, and we are with Joan Waters Keefe. Hi, Joan. Thank, Thank you for coming. And uh, Joan is going to share her memories with us. I'm doing the interviewing. I'm Bill Payne. And with us also is our technical uh, advisor, uh, Alan Grzynski, also past commander. And so, uh, Joan, uh, you served in the uh, Women's Army Auxiliary, Auxiliary Corps. Corps. So obviously you were a volunteer. You didn't yes. get drafted. Okay. And uh, where were you born? Born in Poughkeepsie, New York. Okay. But I never really lived there. Mm -hmm. My mother was a nurse at St. Francis, so when she had her babies who lived in Virginia, she'd go up and have them bring them back. So I went to Virginia when I was four months old and stayed until I was the second year high. Mm -hmm. Then I moved to uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Okay. And you were living in Baltimore, Maryland when you enlisted in the, in the Army? Yes. Okay. And why did you join? Because I was so, I wanted to do something for my country. I was so patriotic and just itching to go. And I thought, well, I'll replace a soldier. And in those days, the women didn't do the things they do now in the Army. So we didn't have guns or any of that, or any training like that, really. Mm -hmm. It was more like calisthenics. But anyway, that's why I went in. And why did you pick the Army? I just felt like I wanted to be a real soldier. To me, that was more what, the idea of fighting and all that you know, appealed to me. So. so you picked the Army? Yes. And do you recall all your first days of service? Oh, yes. So tell us about that. Yeah. What well, can I tell you a little bit? But we joined. We were the first wax to ever be formed in a group, and and be uh, enlist all at once. They took us to Annapolis, Maryland, on a little train, and we had the ceremony. And we all enlisted. I can't remember the number of the people, but quite a group. And then we all went to Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, on the, a train. It wasn't a troop train then. Mm -hmm. So it, I never forget that first day. So, sorry if I keep talking. So, when I get, we got there, we all got out and they marched us. We didn't have a march, but we were all walking through the camp. And uh, they stopped along the way to go through a tree. Well, this one girl I'd gotten friendly with, the two of us thought, all these people, you know, we went in and we saw there were no compartments. We stood there and we wouldn't go. So we waited till everybody was finished and then we went. And we got outside, we couldn't find the people we were with before, except they were in civilian clothes. So finally we saw them all trailing off and we had to run and catch up with them. So we were horrified at that. We got used to it after a while. So we, they marched around the camp, showed us everything, and then took us to the barracks. And that too was so different. It was, I'd never been at the way to camp, but it was kind of like camp, you know, all these beds. And then they started telling us what we had to do, where we had to put our uniforms and all. Oh, and I, I guess they gave us the uniforms then, too. We marched through and got our stuff. So, and the first time going to a mess hall and seeing the food and the way they served it, like on trays of tin or something, that not like I was used to. But, and then the first morning, they had grits. And I'd never had grits. We thought they were dessert. We didn't know it was the breakfast food. So it was funny to get used to it. But it was fun to see, I mean, everybody was from different places, and you started meeting people, and so. You said you met a lot of uh, young women who seemed to be of Polish descent, did you mention that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, another thing, when we started asking one another why we joined and all that, I really discovered that not many people joined for the reason, I'm sure there were others. But a lot of them were small town, really small town people, and they'd never been anywhere. I had lived in New York and lived in a lot of different places, so I didn't feel that way. But they were real shy and country girls, like, and they went in for the experience. So it was really su surprising. And uh, what kind of training did they give you then at boot camp? Really, when I think of it, it was again like camp. We had calisthenics outside. We had little uh, seersucker uh, dresses, like with romper pants underneath. And we would just do this kind of stuff. We never really did anything big. And that's all we did. And then we we went to classes. But now, I don't I think it was just being indoctrinated into the service and all that. We didn't learn anything. or Just, oh, and had a march. 
That's, I loved that. I could have marched all day. So we marched, in fact, well, that was later, but I'll say it now. When we went to California and we were the first wax there to ever march in a parade there, the first wax, I cried practically the whole time I was marching. The music and everything, I'd be sobbing. But back to being at Fort Oglethorpe, when they were trying to train us how to march, I can remember once that a couple of us, well, when, you, when you go parade, whatever it is, left or something, we didn't, we shot off and went down the wrong, you know, and we had to catch up with them. So it was all new, but we all it seemed really like it. Yeah, you remember your instructors and what were they, what were they like? Yeah, well, we made fun just like I guess the boys did too. Uh, I can see her now, I can't think of her name. The main, I don't know what you call it, maybe it was first sergeant or something, I forgot the terms. And she was always yelling at us, like, it was like really kid stuff, you know, when you think of it. And you're not supposed to do that. Or, oh, one time we were outside and we're just fooling around on a Sunday afternoon. So I had red pajamas like uh, Dr. Denton's with a thing in the back, bright red, and I went in and put them on. And I was out in the field, you know, dancing around in this, and she was yelling, get back, get back. And I thought she meant step back to get the picture better. because They were all taking pictures. So I kept going like this back and back, and she was having a fit this colonel and all these celebrities were mar coming to see the camp and she didn't want them to see us acting like that. She was so mad. <laughs> Stuff like that happened a lot. You got through boot camp okay? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, that was another thing. When you wake up in the morning, you'd go see the board and see what you had, the gigs? No. What they call them when you, when you made mistakes? Or yeah, did, call a gig. Was yeah. a gig? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, the first time I said, I said, you have to stay in this Saturday. You couldn't go off camp, off base, because I had dust on my slats. And I thought, dust, what are slats? <laughs> you know? Oh, and another thing I did, when I first went in, I was real slow in life about dressing and stuff. So I said, I'm never going to be able to get dressed in time, because I don't know what time it was, 6 o'clock or something like that, got to be out. So I slept. I put my whole uniform on, tie, everything, but I didn't have a real tie, I had a clamp thing. And I'd slide down the covers like this, because I didn't want to mess the bed up, and sleep, and then slide up in the morning. I did that for a few days or a week, maybe a week or so, just so I'd be on time. But then I learned. And the, well, you had to drop a quarter on the bed, and if it bounced, or if it, if it didn't bounce, I guess, it was bad. And the fact that you had to have a locker, and the locker had to be open, and you could, you couldn't just put anything you wanted. That was so new. I guess men felt the same way, but I think women are worse, you know, with, with so many things. And you had this here, this here, and that. And the clothes had to be hung. If you had your uh, coat, overcoat over here, it had to be here, and you couldn't just hang anything up the way you wanted. So that was really hard to get used to. And then we all smoked. And you couldn't, if you, you could smoke, but you couldn't have a cigarette uh, showing or pack or an ashtray. So we had sucret boxes, and we'd sit there and smoke and butt it and put it in where you're supposed to put it, in the top of the tray. The sucret was a tin box, right? Tin box, box yeah. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. you could have. Yeah. And we'd do that. But it was just such a different life. You had mentioned before we were talking that when you did get to go off base, right, if you weren't being punished, yeah. right, <laughs> you got to go to Chattanooga, Tennessee. Yeah. What was that like? Oh, that was a great city. Um, Stone, no, not Stone Mountain, that was a family. There was something really, a, a big hill, Lookout Mountain, that's what Lookout it was. Lookout Mountain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And we used to go up there. We really enjoyed that. A lot of hotels, and we'd have, we spent money on it, or probably from home, it certainly couldn't be money we got in the Army. But, um, we really had fun. Just now, um, you served during World War II, of course, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, could you just tell us uh, the places that you went to? You left boot camp at Fort Oglethorpe. Yeah, Oklahoma, and, that and was the next a month, place. I guess. Yes. About a month think, of boot camp? I think mm -hmm. it was a month. Yeah. And then we all assembled, and they gave us our orders. Mm -hmm. And, of course, that was real dramatic, because somebody could go in here, and, you know, we wouldn't see each other again. So I, a few of us went to Fort uh, 
Commerce Texas to administration school. And I have to say, I was really disappointed because when you joined, I wanted to do something different. I had been, worked in an office and I didn't want to work in another office. Of course, they're going to use your abilities. So there they sent a group of us to Commerce Texas to a East State Teachers College. And um, in my recollection, I don't know what happened to the people who went to college because they were in our building. In fact, they must have had another campus and we took it over. And it was this little town. The people were really nice. They were friendly. Sometimes it was kind of on the outside. They were like, how y'all? Hi, you know. But they really didn't do anything for us. They just did that. And I'll have to say that we sometimes, we met up soldiers and got friendly. And I can remember that we were in a, somebody's car and we drove out to some bootlegger. They had, you couldn't buy liquor, so we had boot got boot like went someplace in another party. So, but while we were there, we marched. We went to Paris, Texas, a town in Texas, and there was an Air Force base near there. And they had never had wax there before either. So it was really nice. They, the Army base, all invited us to the Army base, and each company took a group, and we went in and had dinner with the, at, in the mess hall and the soldiers and all were sitting around and friendly. And then they all took us into, I mean, we met the soldiers and they kind of paired us off so we'd have boy and girl sitting at the table. But it was nice and they were from all over the country. In fact, I went out with one of them for a while there and it was really nice looking back, I never saw them again. But Paris was an interesting little town. And the fact of being the first wax to parade there, it was like we were an oddity and celebrities. So that was fun. And then after Texas, uh, that was your administration school? Yeah. And then you went to um, your next uh, duty assignment, what was that? In Wilmington, California. And that was exciting too because when they, at, in the school, oh, another thing, when you had, um, what did you call it? Charter quarters or something like that. The person that had a state, I'm sure they did in the Army too. The clerk, charter quarters, every night they'd be a different one. And you'd have to sit down in the office, and I had it one night, I was so scared. This big building, this dormitory, and you're sitting alone down in that office, and I I just was petrified. Nothing happened, but it was scary. But anyway, the last night we had a party, and they announced where you were going. So when they announced, I can't remember how many of us, went to the Port of Embarkation in Mullen, California. Of course, other people were going other places. So everybody was like, oh, you're going overseas. And it was so dramatic. We want, I wanted to go overseas, but it, we cried and we kissed and talked like, um, maybe never see you again and all this and that. And there we got out to California in Wilmington. And um, in the barracks, but the barracks was right in the village. I can't remember. I guess the village was, no, it doesn't seem like the name of the village was Wilmington. But anyway, the barracks were right in the village. So it was funny to be right on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And if you were, if something was wrong, dust on your slats or something, you were punished. And I remember I had to pull weeds. Well, it was embarrassing to be in this seersucker little outfit. And they had army officers that were going overseas, staying in barracks right across the street. And there, it felt like a simpleton out there pulling weeds, you know, it would be different on the army base. But, so uh, we worked in different offices in the port of location. And then I discovered I was never going to overseas. So I said, oh no, you're permanently here. And I was in an office where um, anybody going overseas, the supply officer from the ship, from a different company or something, would come in there and have to tell what supplies he had and all the things they were taking on the ship and how many men and how many uniforms and how, all that, the supplies. So it was, it was interesting and kind of sad too because you meet these people and you know they're going overseas. And we had, the whole town was full of bar, 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 barrage balloons. I didn't know what they were when I first got there. And at night, the, no lights or anything. Where we lived there was, but not in the, in the uh, portable location. And the, um, they, well, they, so many people came in and entertained us. 
and you'd be out, we'd be sitting out on the battleships, on the decks, and it was really dramatic, because they only had a little bit of lights, and once in a while they'd have sirens and things, and they would entertain Hollywood. Some of the stars entertained were kind of has though. So. Well, they were like George Raft, I remember, mm -hmm. and I can't, a couple of my, I really forget, except for George Raft, because we laughed. We thought he was panting when he was dancing and stuff like that. And we thought, what a has-been. We didn't want to see George Rath. We did see some, a couple of actresses that I don't even, I can't remember who they were now. But pop, you know, popular. Not like big stars. Mm -hmm. But we had quite a bit of entertainment, which was nice. But the battle, being entertained on the troop ships was really great. Mm -hmm. But they, those people came to the barracks and, and the hall. And they, did you get a chance to go on leave anywhere or any furlough or anything like that? Oh, I, ca I came home mm -hmm. on the train all the way back to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. My family was living in Atlanta, so we there. Mm -hmm. And we didn't, we just did a lot of things in California, we just immediately. We, oh, well, we had a big parade in Los Angeles when we first got there. And that was, we were the first to actually ever be there. So that was really something. And the Automobile Club of America entertained us at the hotel, I don't remember the name of the hotel. But we, we went in, this, well first we had the parade, and then after they took us to this hotel, and some person from the Automobile Club would meet each one of us as we came in and take us into this dinner. And I don't remember if they had entertainment, but it was really a nice affair, and they talked about us, of course, and praised us. So that was nice. And when we got outside and got back in the trucks, there was a couple, a lot of people standing around, but this one couple was standing there. And they were watching us get in. And they finally tapped us, this up Verna, Verna, I can't remember her name either, boy, so many years ago. But anyway, tapped us on the shoulder and said, could we talk to you? And we said, yes. She said, well, their daughter, it was a man and woman, their daughter was had joined the wax. And she was in, on the East Coast. And they would like to do something for a wax on the West Coast. So we were fortunate they picked us. So maybe because we must have been her size because we wore her clothes later. But they invited us to the house. So after that, we spent so many weekends at their house. And they took us everywhere. All around Hollywood and showed us the, the uh, studios and maybe big producers' homes, and told us about some of them that were doing all kinds of things, you know, inviting service people there and all. So they sh the little Brea tar pits, you don't hear about those anymore. And that, to me, was amazing, those tar pits right in the middle of Los Angeles. So we spent so much time with them at their home, and we even wore their daughter's clothes, because she left her things home. So we have the, her slacks on and stuff. This is a picture in a way you're right here. Oh, yeah, right, right here. Yeah. Okay. And they were such a nice couple. I've lost track of them. I think I kept in touch with them for a few years uh -huh. after. So there's a picture of the lady herself and her little daughter. Right, and my friend Edna. Edna, Edna Zerner. Where's Edna? I lost track of her completely. I did see her after. This is you her. on this side over here, right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And she was, from, well, they were all from Baltimore that we joined together, so she was from Baltimore. Yeah. And even though I'd gone to high school there and all, it's a big city, I didn't know anybody in that. Yeah. None of us knew one another. And then while we're down here, we'll take a look through. You were also awarded the uh, Women's Army Corps Medal, which was a servant in the Women's Army Corps. Yes. And uh, World years War II, later. Years later, yeah. And the World War II Victory Medal yeah. for having served during World War II in support of uh, the Allied effort in World War II. Right. And uh, this is your honorable discharge, yes. I see here, yes. from the uh, Women's Army Corps. Army Corps, which came years later. And as you mentioned, you were in the WAAC, well, yes. uh -huh, which was supplanted eventually by the WAC. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a story in itself. Yeah. Because um, when, the, when the Army decided to make us part of the Army, they couldn't just, we had to get out. We had to, uh, whatever you call it, be discharged and re-enlist because they can't force you to be in. At that time, they couldn't. Yeah. So, about 60 of us in California didn't want to go back in. And I look back now and I think, I was dissatisfied. 
but that's, I think soldiers are always dissatisfied. And if we hadn't had that opportunity, I, we wouldn't have even thought about it. But the more they talked, the more we started thinking, well, why should I stay in? I had asked the, uh, my captain in the office I worked in, when I first got there, I said, tell me about the soldier I'm replacing. And he said, what? And I said, the man that I'm replacing. He said, you're not replacing anybody. We made a job for you. Well, that was the most deflating thing. That was a real shock. So that kind of thing. And another thing, people on the outside, civilians, really kind of looked down on whites. And I was really angry at that. I had never seen anything. I can't say one thing I saw that was wrong, you know, that they did. I'm sure individuals did, like everybody. But there was nothing to be ashamed of. And then soldiers sometimes would say, like, they pick, think you could pick them up over all in the same. So, well, if I liked them, I would, but I, that burned me up too. So all those things start eating at us. And maybe the fact that we were not doing what we thought we were doing and getting such little pay for it. Although we certainly managed, we used to go out and eat and everything. I don't know how we did it, but we, we would walk down to, oh, in fact, I took my laundry. A couple of us didn't want to wash our clothes, so we dragged our laundry to a laundry place in town. But anyway, we started thinking of those things. So when we got out, we wouldn't get back in. And they sent top brass women from all over to talk to us. And of course, the more they talked to us, that was a big thing to lose 60 people. So I got out and didn't get back in. So it was years later that the Army decided to give an honorable discharge to anybody that the auxiliary corps. Mm -hmm. I think it was the 50s. Yeah. And I just happened to hear about it. So people kept telling me, why don't you look into it? Why don't you look into it? So I got the discharge, got the medals, and was I didn't get any um, mustering out pay because I wasn't from the state that gave it. Mm -hmm. So, but I had the GI Bill. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. well, while we, while you were in, how did you, you mentioned that you got a chance to get home on furlough to your family, and how else did you keep in touch with them? Oh, I wrote. I always was a letter writer. Yeah. Still am. Uh -huh. People don't do it anymore. <laughs> but wrote, and I don't think they didn't ever visit me. I had friends that visited me. Mm -hmm. You know, I couple of times. In fact, it was funny when it was in basic training because I had uh, somebody I'd been dating and he was an officer. And I can remember that because when he came, he didn't know where to sleep and they let him sleep. They let him sleep in the uh, headquarters, the room where people, the office. And that was so funny to think of that. So, I mean, I saw people and just only went home at once. Mm -hmm. Now, you had mentioned the fact that uh, it was, a, it was a, a little getting used to to get fed off a tin tray and all. How was the food generally? Well, I was a real picky eater anyway. I didn't like this, I didn't like that. But the funny thing is, the one thing I liked that nobody seems to like, I love the stew. I thought that stew was so good. But outside of that, we used to walk in the barracks, in the, well, in basic training, we couldn't eat it. But out in California, we would walk in, in the mess hall go over and look at the food and say, ugh, and walk out and go to a hotel. <laughs> and one, oh, liver. I had never had liver in my life. And I thought it was steak. And I thought, oh, boy. <laughs> and I put it on my plate. I took one bite. I thought, oh, I'm going to die. And they, they really made they, they said they wanted you to eat all your food. Mm -hmm. They'd stand there. Somebody stood there. So really in trouble. You did have plenty of everything supply-wise, everything you needed. You know. Yes, okay. I really did. Now, I had mentioned you did get some entertainment and so forth, and uh, you talked about Do you remember any particular, you already told us some very humorous events. Can you think of something else that was sort of humorous uh, during that time, or in particular? Well, uh, well, along with that, we also asked, like, did people play pranks on each other, that type of thing? I think they short-sheeted people. I don't think I ever. I never could figure out how to do it. <laughs> but they did do that. And I'm sure they did some other little things. It really was a, night, a great experience, looking back. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, um, and 
generally, I'd say everybody seemed to get along together. Now, you take a look at some of your photographs again, there too, also, right? Yeah. And you mentioned here that uh, this is one of the ladies that you served with? Yes. Do you remember where this was? That was a basic training. Basic training. Yeah. And now that I think of it, I don't know when it was, mm -hmm. but some of those people came to my house, maybe after I got out or mm -hmm. I didn't see these, They none of these people went to yeah. California. Okay. But uh, I remember they did come to my house house in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and my mother and father, especially this one girl, because she had a really good voice, and I know she sang, sang for my uh, family, and they mm -hmm. really liked it. So I did see a few of them. Here's a really great picture of a, a troop train. Oh, that you yeah, took. I yeah. love that. This is going out by the desert there? And yeah, on the way to California. On the way to California, right? And that's a troop train. You can see the front of it. It was so long, mm -hmm. and because of the curve. Yeah. And when you look at the window, you see the front of the train. Yeah, there's a mountain there, huh? That was another interesting experience, yeah. being on a troop train. Mm -hmm. the, um, we, all we did, and of course there was no air conditioning or anything, mm -hmm. and going through the desert, the grit, we had the windows open because we were going to stand it, mm -hmm. and the dust blowing in, and we spent the whole time out the windows. Every time another, uh, every once in a while, another troop train would come, mm -hmm. and we'd have to get off the side tracks yeah. and let it go by. And it would slow down, and we'd all say, "Where are you from?" In fact, we got off. We could get off and stand, you know, a little while, mm -hmm. stand and smoke. And I never met. I was looking for somebody that I would know, or was from my hometown. Mm -hmm. Never did. But we would always say, "Where are you from? Where are you from?" You had mentioned it. We're looking at the photographs here. Is this picture here? Right? Just tell us about this. This is. Uh... Oh, that's one of the girls. Mm -hmm from uh, basic training. Mm -hmm. And this is my family's home in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. And that wasn't such a long trip. I can't even remember how long. Yeah. But, so we came we came on the train, mm -hmm. and my brother was home on here. And he was in the Army? He was in the Army Air Force. Okay. And he was stationed someplace, I can't even remember at that time, mm -hmm. at Air Force, not too far away yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he was home, and we spent a few days yeah. with my family. That was great. And of course, we were so proud of our uniforms, and we marched all over the yard. And, yeah. and you, uh, you had mentioned about how you met your husband and so forth, and he was in the military. Oh, yeah. Tell us about that. Tell us well, about I didn't meet my husband through the military. No. We were childhood sweethearts. Mm -hmm. But I had moved away, and I lived in uh, Baltimore, gone to school in New York, and been engaged. It was, you know, no thought of him. And when I was first in the service, I was on a train and I saw this soldier and for some reason I thought of him of a clear sky and I thought, I wonder if that's what he would look like. So when I got back to the barracks, I decided to find out. So I wrote to somebody, the scoutmaster in our neighborhood, and he was involved in the scouts, and, and he knew my family well. So I said, well, where is Jim Keith? And he wrote back and said, of course I remember you and I remember you and Jimmy and blah, blah, blah. So he gave me his address, and I wrote to him. So we started a correspondence. So when I, that that might have been part of the reason I got out too, because he was in in Georgia at the time, and my family lived in Atlanta. So I got out. In fact, I even asked his advice, and he was saying, "Get out of that." And uh, so I went home, and he came over from Athens, Georgia, and. We met, we hadn't seen each other since early high school, but uh, even early high school I didn't pay attention to him because he didn't grow up as fast as I did. Girls are often like that, so I really did. I used to see him, notice him, but I didn't want anybody to think I was looking at him. So we hadn't been together as adults. Anyway, next thing you know, he went overseas. We were only together a short while. And he went overseas, so. He was, a, he was in Anzio Beachhead. He was in Africa first, and, and a decorated Corps de Guerre and Silver Star, and wounded twice, and he became a captain. And uh, in the infantry, it was really rough. So he came home two years later, and we were married like right after he came home. But, oh, and then we went to uh, Texas, because his, uh, he was in the Thunderbirds. Mm -hmm. So his outfit was in Texas, so we went back to Texas. But he had a, uh, a, a leave, a recuperation leave. 
So we spent I, almost a year just doing what we wanted. Traveled everywhere and spent all our money and <coughs> came back and settled down. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, you really have uh, mentioned the fact that you did, uh, you certainly did, uh, um, after you got in service and then you know, with your husband and so forth. Um, you eventually, uh, in addition to being a, a wife and mother and so forth, uh, you did continue your education, you had told me, and your yeah. career and so forth. But another, thing, about, yeah, another thing I was thinking of was the fact that after I got out, I was living in Atlanta. And I went to work for uh, Bell Aircraft in Marietta, Georgia. And I was in the employment office. But we had a lot of entertainment there, too. They came, Jerry Colon and Bob Hope and all. They stood on the airplanes there and entertained us. So I worked for them until he came up from overseas. So you were still continuing with the war yeah. because you were helping in defense right. Yeah. And even before, before I went in the wax, mm -hmm. way before, right out of high school, I had worked at Edward Arsenal where they they um, inspected, well, they, I, they might have made them, but we inspected the gas masks. That was our job. Mm -hmm. So it was all the same vein, you know. It really involved your, your life in the, in the war during that, yeah. during that time. Right. Yeah. So um, then you did, uh, you did, you were entitled to GI Bill, but not right at that time. No. I, okay. None of this, like I wasn't honorable discharge. I had an honorable discharge from the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. Yeah. But all that came. Some year, I think it was in the 50s, mm -hmm. or it might have been even later, no? No, I think it was later than that, yeah. that they paid. Mm -hmm. It might have been the 70s. 70. I bet it was the 70s. I went to um, college, the community college in the 70s. Mm -hmm. But I didn't use the GI Bill, but I could have. You could have. Yeah. I'm going to write now and try to get the money back. <laughs> so you got an associate's degree? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And what other kind of work did you do? But I didn't use it. I was going to go on, mm -hmm. and I even got a little scholarship to go. But I always liked antiques, so at that point, I made the decision to open an antique shop. So I had an antique shop for 25 years and just gave it up a couple of years ago. The fancy flea here in Yeah, Sorry, it's right, right here in Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So that was an interesting mm -hmm. thing to do. You really already told us a lot about uh, the effect that this had on your life overall, but uh, if you could just sort of summarize uh, your feeling about the military and life in general and what this effect had on you, you know, just tell us. Yes. Well, it's, I've certainly swung around to an entirely different thing. I'm now a member of the Veterans for Peace. So the things I did before, I felt strongly the things I do now. And it's just a different kind of situation. World War II was something I would do it again. But outside of that, I am so opposed to most wars, and I think they could be averted. And the veterans for peace certainly care. In fact, I have a button that says, honor veterans, no more war. So my life is really devoted to trying to do something about that. I don't know if you want me to say it, but I've been arrested <laughs> twice for peace. So for uh, going to the recruiting offices and handing out leaflets and trying to uh, show young people there's other alternatives. And people will say, well, or somebody will come up to you and say, well, I'm a veteran. I say, well, I'm a veteran too. But that's the way I feel, and I'm working as hard as I can in that field. Anything else you'd like to add? I, no, I don't think so, except it was a it was a very interesting experience. And you look back, you know, you look at things differently as you get older. And it was really, I think they did a good job. I was really upset that I wasn't going overseas. And I was upset they made a job. But I'm sure there are many WACs that did very important jobs. And something I'm proud to do. Well, thanks for your service. Yeah. Well, thanks thank for you. Our I enjoyed talking to you. Thank you very much.